Hey everyone, and welcome back. Let's dive right into today's topic. We're going way back in time, exploring the fascinating world of the Mi'kmaq people. But not just any exploration, we're taking a deep dive into their societal structure and how they tackle tough decisions, especially when facing the unexpected. And what better way to understand this than through a captivating story? Always a good way to learn. Right. So we'll be taking a close look at Mexli Un Number Two. It's a story from this book, Pasted Text, specifically Chapter 1, Begainland Mid Thry First Nations in Canada. Now, picture this a vast land shaped by the changing seasons, brimming with life and resources. Oh, so this was home to the Mi'kmaq people long before European contact. And at the center of our story is a young Mi'kmaq boy, Miguel Wayne, with a thirst for adventure, natural. Ah, the adventurous spirit of youth. It's amazing how one story can offer us such a rich glimpse into an entire culture, you know? Exactly. We get to see how their lives were intertwined with the land, mm. how their society was structured, how they interacted with other First Nations groups, all through the eyes of this young boy. It's like a window into another world. Totally. So Michelle's out exploring one day, because what else are curious young boys supposed to do? And he gets caught in a massive forest fire. Oh, wow. Talk about being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Yeah. A real brush with danger. And this wasn't just any fire, right? This was a disaster that could mess things up for the Mi'kmaq for years. They relied on, you know, seasonal migrations for hunting and gathering. Mm. And this fire, this fire threatened their winter hunting grounds. Those were, like, essential for their survival. Yeah, it really makes you think about how vulnerable they were to nature. But here's the amazing part. They weren't helpless. Right. Mizel, for example. He manages to survive this raging fire by taking refuge in a fish pond. Talk about resourceful. He was clearly one smart cookie. He was. But it also shows just how deeply the Mi'kmaq understood their environment. Oh, absolutely. They didn't just live in nature. They lived with it, understanding its rhythms, its resources. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. But even with all that knowledge, I mean, this fire, this was a major challenge. Totally. It yeah. really makes you think, you know, like, what were they saying to each other? Their whole world was literally up in flames. I can't even imagine. So how do they deal with a crisis of this magnitude? I mean, what do you do when your entire world quite literally goes up in smoke? Yeah. So they had this huge problem on their hands. Yeah, this is where we really see their social structure in action. Oh, OK. I see where you're going with this. They had these systems in place for making these really difficult decisions together as a community. And this this fire really put those systems to the test. Oh, absolutely. This was a defining moment for them. So what they do? Do they just like wander around hoping for the best? No, no, not at all. They gathered. Okay. The story mentions a community meeting, but this wasn't just like a casual get together. Right. This was serious business. So give us the rundown. Like what did this decision making process actually look like for them? All right. So imagine a group of people all gathered together, connected by this shared history and this deep, deep respect for their traditions. At the heart of it all were the elders. Of course. Keepers of knowledge. The voices of experience. They would play a huge role in guiding the conversation. Makes sense. Sharing their wisdom, their insights. So it's like tapping into the collective wisdom of generations. Exactly. Precisely. And then you had the leader, the Sakama. Okay, the Sakama. This is an important term, the Sakama. Right. That's what they called their leaders. I think chiefs or captains. Right. But even the Sakama, they didn't rule with an iron fist. Interesting. Their leadership was all about consensus building, making sure everyone had a voice. Wow. And that decisions were made for the good of the entire community and not just, you know, a few. That is so different than a lot of societies today, where it's so much about individual ambition and power. So what did this whole consensus building process actually lead them to? Well, they realized they needed a new hunting ground and fast. Yeah, it makes sense. Their traditional territory. Totally compromised by the fire. Right. And winter. Oh, winter was coming. Uh, so they made a decision. They would reach out to the Pictuk, the Pictuk, another First Nations group, and they would request permission to share their hunting grounds. Whoa, hold on a second. To ask for help from another group. Ah. Uh, That's a big deal. I mean, weren't there like often tensions between different First Nations? Oh, there were, absolutely. But there were also these like established ways of interacting, mm -hmm. of maintaining those relationships. And this is where the Grand Council comes in. Okay, the Grand Council. Think of it as like an intertribal summit made up of Sakamas from all seven Mi'kmaq districts. Oh, yeah, all seven. They would meet. Yeah. And they would discuss, you know, things like diplomacy, trade, even things like territorial boundaries. So the Mi'kmaqs weren't just like one big group. 
but a collection of these different districts, yeah. each with their own Sakama. Exactly, you got it. Yeah. They had this really complex system of governance that allowed them to stay unified, but also respect the autonomy of each district. Wow, that's fascinating. Yeah, and the story, it doesn't really get into the nitty gritty of the Grand Council's role in this specific situation, but it's safe to assume that a decision this big Reaching out to the Pictup for help right. would have definitely involved some serious communication, some coordination between these districts. Yeah, for sure. So back to the story. Yeah. They decide to send a runner to the Pictup. Mm -hmm. Can you, like, set the scene for us? Oh, imagine the weight of that responsibility. Right. right. Yeah. Carrying the hopes of your entire community on your shoulders, traveling for days, maybe even weeks, through unknown territory, possibly dangerous. Yeah, that's no small feat. And he wasn't just a messenger, this runner. He was a diplomat, an ambassador yeah. carrying this message of, of hope, but also a bit of desperation, right? Yeah, absolutely. So how did the pick took respond? Well, they could have easily just turned them away. Yeah. I mean, resources were precious. And welcoming another group into your territory, that always came with risks. Right. But in a true testament to their character, the pick took, they chose compassion. Wow. They welcomed them in. They even built them temporary shelters. Wow, that's that's amazing. So it wasn't every every man for himself back then. No, not at all. You okay. see, for many First Nations cultures, the well-being of the community, that was everything. Sharing, cooperation, these weren't just ideals. They were woven into the very fabric of their society. It's a beautiful thing. It really is. And for the Piktuk, this wasn't just about survival, right? Offering refuge that was deeply ingrained in their cultural fabric. It's like a whole different way of looking at the world. Exactly. It really makes you think about how different societies define success. That's a good point. You know, for the Piktuk, it wasn't just about individual prosperity. It was about the well-being of everyone. The collective good. Precisely. Is a powerful reminder that there are just different ways of being in this world. There really are. Different ways of relating to each other and to the land. Hmm. But there's this other detail in the story that I found really interesting. Okay. Didn't it mention something about the Kespaquik? Ugh. Ah, yes, the Kespaquik. That's an important detail. Okay, so tell me more. Remind me. It wasn't just any Piktuk district that took them in. It was the Kespaquik. And they were known for their abundance of resources. Ah, okay. So they were already starting from a place of abundance. Which I guess probably made it a little easier to be generous, right? You could say that. But there's more to it than that, right? Hmm. Didn't the Kespaquik Sakama do something pretty remarkable? He did. And this is where we see, yet again, the brilliance of Micmac society. Okay. This Sakama, he understood that integrating these newcomers, it wasn't just about giving them food and shelter. Mm. It was about creating a sense of belonging. Okay. Weaving them into the social fabric of the community. So he did something really smart. He paired families from the Mi'kmaq and the Kespukwik together, encouraged them to share meals, stories, traditions, you know, really get to know each other. Wow, that is incredible. It's like he was orchestrating cultural exchange. Exactly. And understanding at such a personal level. He was a master of social engineering in a way. He really was. And think about the long-term implications of that, you know? Yeah. By fostering these connections, he was helping to prevent misunderstandings, build trust, ensure a smoother integration. It's amazing how much thought went into their like their social structures. It is, isn't it? They clearly understood that a community, mm -hmm. it's only as strong as the bonds that hold it together. Wise words. This Kespuko Takama sounds like quite the leader. He was a wise one, for sure. So where does our friend Misel fit into all of this? He's been through a lot. He has. But remember, this deep dive it's not just about the fire's impact on the Mi'kmaq as a whole. Right. It's about how this one event, this fire, ripples through the life of this one young boy. That's right. It's easy to get caught up in the big picture. And forget that at the heart of it all. Our individual stories. Precise. Individual experiences. And Measle's story, well, it takes a really heartwarming turn. Oh, good. Amidst all of this chaos, he befriends a Kespaquik boy named Member Two, mm -hmm. and years later, Member Two actually jokes that the fire was a blessing in disguise because it brought them together. Oh, I love that. It just speaks to the resilience of the human spirit, you know. It really does. Even in the face of these immense challenges, we have this incredible capacity to adapt, to connect, mm -hmm. to find hope and joy, even in the most unexpected places. It's truly remarkable. And that brings us to one of the most, I think, poignant moments in the story, the ending. Ah. Uh, 
yeah. I was hoping we'd get to that. The ending really stayed with me. As the story comes to a close, Mizzle, he reflects on everything he's been through. And he shares this really profound insight. Okay. He says, and I quote, Sometimes the creator lets a deer escape, but then he shows you duck eggs in the grass, which can also satisfy your hunger. Ooh, that's a good one. Yeah. Break that down for us. What does that mean? Well, it's a proverb, uh -huh. and it really encapsulates the Mi'kmaq worldview. Right. It speaks to their deep, deep connection to the natural world. They're understanding that even when things go wrong, even when we face setbacks, when we face loss, there's always something else out there. There's always something else. It's about resourcefulness, yeah. adaptability, and trusting in a greater plan. It's like they understood that life is full of surprises, good and bad. It is. And that the key to navigating those surprises is to be adaptable, to be resourceful, mm -hmm. and to trust that even when one path closes... Another one opens. Another one opens up. It's yeah. like a little nugget of wisdom you can carry with you. Absolutely. It's a good one. It's a reminder that even when things are uncertain, even when things are changing, mm -hmm. there's always something to be grateful for. There's always a reason to hope. I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm really drawn to this Mi'kmaq worldview, their connection to nature, their focus on community, their ability to find resilience and hope in the face of adversity. It's also inspiring. It really is. It reminds us that there are many ways of being in the world, many ways of, of building society. Of making decisions. Of relating to each other mm -hmm. and to the natural world. Their story is powerful. It reminds us that we can learn so much from the past, from cultures that have, you know, navigated the complexities of life for centuries. Absolutely. Cultures that have so much to teach us. So before we wrap up, what are some key takeaways that you hope our listeners are taking away from today's deep dive? I think the biggest thing is really understanding these pre-colonial indigenous societies on their own terms, you know? The Mi'kmaq, like other First Nations, they had their own sophisticated systems, their own ways of life that were in balance with the natural world. It's about, I think, challenging our assumptions, you know, uh -huh. realizing that history, it's so much more than what we often get in textbooks. It's like we view history through such a specific lens yeah. That we miss out on all these other stories, these rich, nuanced stories. Exactly. And these stories, like the one we're talking about today, they're not just interesting anecdotes, right? Right. They offer us valuable insights into, you know, human resilience, adaptability, the power of community. Mm. I mean, think about how the Mi'kmaq responded to this devastating fire, their mm. decision-making process, reaching out to the Pictook, their emphasis on integration, on social cohesion. These are lessons that are still irrelevant especially today in our world, facing these complex challenges like climate change, social fragmentation. It really makes you wonder, what have we lost in our modern pursuit of progress? You know, That's a good question. We talk about innovation. But here's this culture that they understood this interconnectedness of all things. They had these systems in place for making decisions. That benefited the whole community, right. not just a select few. It's humbling. It really is. It reminds us that progress, it doesn't always mean abandoning traditional knowledge or ways of being. Mm. It can also mean looking to the past for inspiration, guidance on how to create a more just and sustainable future. So as we kind of wrap up our deep dive into the world of the Mi'kmaq, what's like one thing you hope our listeners really take away from this story, this glimpse into another way of life? That's a great question. You know, I think that Mi'kmaq proverb about the deer and the duck eggs, it really sums it up. Life, it's full of surprises. And sometimes those surprises, they disrupt our plans. They force us to change course. Mm -hmm. But within those disruptions, there's always opportunity, always a chance to, to adapt, to learn, to discover new sources of sustenance, both yeah. literally and figuratively. You know, if we can embrace that mindset, that spirit of resilience, that resourcefulness, yeah. we'll be better equipped to navigate the challenges that come our way. Beautifully said. It yeah. really makes you think, what if we approached our own lives, our own communities, with that same sense of interconnectedness, that adaptability that the Mi'kmaq embodied? What kind of world could we create? Something to ponder, right? Definitely something to think about as you move through your day. And on that note, we'll wrap up our deep dive into Mi'kmaq society. Until next time, keep exploring, keep learning, and keep those aha moments coming. Mm -hmm.